Okay. All right, I think I'm recording. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, the organizers of this conference. We put together an excellent roster of scholars, and I'm very honored to be included in on the roster. Um, my name is Kenyon Cavender. Uh, I am a graduate student at Binghamton University in the sociology department. My main focus is on housing, particularly the ecology of housing. And I think that there are some interesting ways that the World Ecological Framework can, uh, can shed new light on the housing situation, the housing crisis that's ongoing. Um, so as I'm sure all of you are aware, we are currently in the middle of one of the largest housing crises in recent US history. In particular, since the 2008 financial crisis, um, housing instability among many people has become more or less ubiquitous and unremarkable. It's, it's simply a fact of life. Recent environmental crises, um, specifically the 2014 Flint water crisis and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, have illuminated new cracks in our current housing situation. They've demonstrated ways that multiple crises of capital can compound on each other and exacerbate each other in, um, in unforeseen ways. So specifically during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were multiple eviction moratoriums and rent relief funds but in spite of all of this, over the past two years, the courts and the police have continued to evict poor people all over the country. And landlords have continued to exercise outsized control over the quality of life of precarious populations. The housing crisis lays bare the fact that crises of capital are also fundamentally crises of life. The current state of things demands that we reassess our assessment of how housing and environment are produced through capitalism. The scale and the scope of the problem wants for a robust and yet flexible framework of analysis. And I think that the understanding of capitalism as a world ecology provides this. As the mounting environmental crises show us, we must move beyond thinking of nature and society as separate poles of reality and see them as dialectically unified. This is especially true of housing. It is most accurately seen as a bundle of coercive relationships that bend both labor and nature to capital's ends. If we're going to understand the home, or the, the home as the primary site of social reproduction, we must see the mechanisms of capital's appropriation of cheap nature and labor. And perhaps most importantly, housing must be analyzed as a built environment. It's a fundamental part of capitalism's way of organizing nature, to quote Jason Moore. So this talk will briefly visit some scholars whose work can help us re-examine the housing situation specifically in the US. So often when we talk of housing instability or the housing crisis or, or um, housing unaffordability, discussions center the concept of commodification. Uh, I'm sure the, the phrase commodification of housing is, is a familiar one to everyone here. So if we define commodification of housing loosely as the separation of the use value from exchange value, then the commodification of housing operates by privileging the profit motive in the housing market over the material needs of residents for a place to live. Um, in their book, In Defense of Housing, came out a couple of years ago, Peter Marcuse and David Madden offer up a typical description of this process. Slowly and fitfully, housing was disembedded from the circuits of work and production to become a direct bearer of economic value in itself. In the 19th century, Western cities came to feature an industrial proletariat no longer housed in or chained to their place of work. Now, for the first time, majorities of people looked to the open market to secure their place of residence. Cash payment became the main nexus between house and householder. The conditions that enabled the commodification of housing had emerged. So this is certainly a good place to start in our analysis of the housing situation. Uh, in fact, in Capital Volume 1, one of Marx's main concerns is the extent to which life is mediated through the commodity form. And over 150 years later, the idea of the commodity as the elementary form of the wealth of societies is essential to our understanding and critique of capitalism. However, we cannot limit ourselves to elementary forms. 
And the general presentation uh, of commodification of housing that Peter Marcuse and David Madden offer up is insufficient to the task of understanding the housing crisis. In particular, the idea of housing as a breaker of chains between worker and workplace, and also the assumption of an open housing market. Both of these ideas are problematic. In addressing the first one, the, the idea of, of commodified housing freeing us from our place of work, Engels points out in the housing question that home ownership is a tether just as surely as any other form of residency. As homeowners bound to their homes by expensive mortgages, workers are compelled to put up with whatever working conditions are offered them. Capitalist innovation never offers the freedom it claims and commodified housing is no different. As the free worker is free only to choose between exploitation and starvation, so also the free and open housing market offers only the choice between exposure and acquiescence to capital's social organization. And so here, I think we reach a fundamental point. Capital uses the commodity form as a means of social control, but capital is not limited to the commodity form. Its arsenal for organizing society is much larger than that. So with houses and with home ownership um, comes housework and comes the expulsion of women from commodity production and the wage relation. Silvia Federici uh, is, is a, a thinker who has dealt at length with this problem. And she quotes in her book, The Patriarchy of the Wage, that however, Marx places this production solely within the circuit of commodity production. The only exception being the activities involved in workers' training. Marx imagines that the workers buy with their wages the necessities of life, and then, by consuming them, reproduce themselves. At no point in capital does Marx recognize that the reproduction of labor power requires some domestic work, preparing food, washing and mending clothes, cleaning, raising children, and making love. Sylvia Federici's work on the development of the Western family as a creation of capital for capital tracks with the organization of the working class residencies into single family homes or apartments. By relocating a significant portion of the work of social reproduction to the home, capital is able to use unpaid feminized work within the home as a downward pressure on the cost of labor. Capital's radical reorganization of the domestic sphere takes place in and through the home, which is a connection that warrants extensive consideration. So if we're looking at the idea of a working class reproducing itself and the necessities for reproduction of, of class, um, the requirements of the existence of the working class are mediated in large part through housing. Access to transportation, clean air, water, and often food are all determined in large part by where and in what one lives. So for here, it's, it's productive to turn to ecology for some insight into this process. Richard Lewinton, writing in The Triple Helix, pushes back against the idea that the environment is a static external world in which organisms exist. And he talks of the co-production of environment by organisms and organisms by environment. Uh, this is, Importantly, not unique to humans. The world inhabited by living organisms is constantly being changed and reconstructed by the activities of all of those organisms, not just by human activity. Uh, that is a quote from the Triple Helix. Uh, however, what is perhaps unique or novel is the manner in which environment is now mediated through capital and through class antagonism. Capitalism affects enormous ecological change in the pursuit of valorization and social control. Environment, read as the interaction between intra and extra human nature taking place extensively in the home, is constantly reorganized to serve the ends of capital. So in the little bit of time that we have left, um, I think it would be productive to look at some concrete analysis of housing within the black radical tradition. Um, it's no coincidence that just housing is the fourth point on the Black Panther Party's 10 point program. Huey Newton, in discussion of the situation of black communities in America, points out that two Americas exist. In Oakland, you have the rich part of town, uh, and then also you have, uh, and, and I quote from his autobiography, the flatlands, 
that consists of substandard income families that make up about 50% of the population of nearly 450,000. They live in either rundown, crowded West Oakland or dilapidated East Oakland, hemmed in block after block in ancient decaying structures, now cut up into multiple dwellings. So we see here that uh, Huey Newton sees housing as a mechanism of the oppression and control of racialized and poor communities. This is a fundamental part of the Panthers' assertion that Black America is an internal colony. And crucially, this assessment of Black America as an internal colony or as a colonized subject is a statement of solidarity with revolutionaries in Cuba, Vietnam, and Algeria. And it points to the extent that life for the oppressed is mediated through capitalism and through the profit motive. Uh, Kianga, sorry, Kianga Yamada Taylor discusses how this mechanism operates in Black communities in her book, Race for Profit. After the fall of de jure segregation, public-private partnerships maintain the existence of derelict housing through a process she calls predatory inclusion. Banks offered usurious loans to poor families, but limited them to unfit and undesirable homes in neighborhoods with little infrastructure. Predatory lending practices were used to maintain racist and class structures of domination. She quotes in her book, the suggestion that black equality in the real estate market could be achieved by the formal end to housing discrimination failed to take into account the very ways that racial inequality was structured and embedded within the architecture of the system of buying and selling real estate in the United States. Uh, the burden of maintaining unfit housing and reproducing life in adverse conditions remained on poor and racialized communities and was in fact expanded with the growing housing market in the 20th century. As always, access to housing happens on capital's terms or not at all. The freedom to organize life on our own terms is essential to the liberation of society from capitalist social relations. Housing plays a major role in this and as such has major potential both for justice and repression. As it stands, housing is a method of coercion and control and its undemocratic organization leads to continual ecological and social crises. A free society is our goal in organizing and understanding the methods by which capital opposes that is essential. There's a saying that we're all familiar with, charity begins at home. And it's a common one, but perhaps there's a better formulation. The fight for the dissolution of capital begins in the home. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who has uh, listened to this talk. And if you have any questions or comments, I will be open um, to receiving them. And, and hopefully we can have a, a generative discussion starting from these points. Thank you and have a nice day.